Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I got involved in pain research when I did a clinical rotation at a VA hospital a few years ago. And um, one of the most interesting parts of my work was uh, talking to veterans who had uh, had uh, amputations and their very vivid description of pain in a limb that was no longer there. And I think that sums up the complexity of pain and what, what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today in terms of uh, often we think of pain as kind of, oh, it's a wiring system. We have nerves, it travels up to the brain, you experience pain and it comes back down as that experience of pain. It's so much more complicated than that. But all pain is in the brain, without a doubt. But it's not a simple wiring system. We know a lot more about uh, the complexities of this wiring system now than we did when I was an intern at the VA hospital. And we know that um, one major part of the, the system that processes these in incomings, as I call them, is the brain. And as you can see from this diagram, there's no center for pain in the brain. The brain has a very complicated way of processing information, and the pain matrix, which we kind of have stopped using the term pain matrix because it's not specific to pain. The brain processes pain in ways that are similar to how it processes other kinds of information. So one of the take home messages today that all pain is in the brain is pain is not a sensation. It is a perception. And the fact that it's a perception captures this pinging around up the spinal cord and around the brain and back down. It is a perception that involves a very complicated process. We know a lot more about that now. And unfortunately, the complicated process that it involves can break down. And that's what happens with persistent pain. So we actually see a change in the nervous system that's very, very profound. And we see this in animals when we study them in the laboratory. And we see proxies for it when we study people in the laboratory and then when we see them in the clinic. But these changes are really profound and they're very, very important. And we think that's what's driving what Penny was describing in terms of the persistence of pain um, over long periods of time. The bad news is that not only does the ch system change, but that we're now seeing that there are fundamental changes not only in the function of the brain, but in the structure of the brain. And so that's really important. The good news is that when people are successfully treated, those structural changes rebound, and they look better. The bad news is that we don't have great treatments, but I'll come back to that. Okay, so I, I put this here just to remind me to tell you about my VA experience. And, and um, we have learned a lot about the complexity of pain from veterans and from people with spinal cord injuries and amputations because it really speaks to the fact that limbs that are no longer part of the usual perception can still be sending these signals that um, kind of wreak havoc in our spinal cords and our brains. I wanted to show you this, this study because it's a really cool study. It's a little old, but it's one of those wonderful laboratory studies where this guy, Bob Cobb Coghill at Wake Forest, brought healthy people into the, into the lab, poked and prodded them, and gave them the same stimulus. And what's so cool about this slide is the exact same stimulus. And if we did it with people in the room, we'd see a graph like this. And what you see is that some people, whoops, sorry. Some people um, experience their pain, that's, that stimulus is a one or a two. We use a zero to 10 scale for 10 being the most extreme pain. But a, a chunk of people experience that same st stimulus as an eight, nine, or a 10. Exact same thing. So what, what's really cool about that, we know that, right? Some people ha kind of have a broken ankle and they complain and whine a lot and other people kind of keep going. And we think that, oh, that they're just, they're kind of whining and complaining. The really interesting thing about this study is those people's brains look differently. It's not just them kind of making this up. It's not them being hypochondriacs. It's not simply exaggerating. It is the fact that our nervous systems are very different and that nervous system results in the experience, the perception of pain. And so this is just a, a fancy way of showing you that. Um, one of the things that I think is really important in terms of what Penny alluded to is the idea that there, there is a trajectory for people who have pain. Everybody who has pain starts with an event. That event is, can be a trauma. It can be a hurt uh, limb from football or some sporting event. It can be going in for surgery. A good friend of mine had a hernia repair, and he's had persistent pain following a hernia, hernia repair. Thankfully, for most men who have hernia repairs, that doesn't happen. But there's a small segment of men who have persistent pain following hernia repairs. The problem with that is that we get a lot of hernia repairs in the US, so that translates then into a fair number of persistent pain. Um, so the thing to think about with pain is it starts with some event. Um, many people can identify a 
time when it onset, not necessarily an acute injury. But what happens is it then kind of unfolds over time. And we know more and more about the factors that influence the unfolding of it. So for example, we know that people who are less educated are more likely to have persistent pain following surgery. We know older people are more likely to have persistent pain following surgery. We know that some psychological characteristics of people going into surgery predict how, much, how severe their pain is postoperatively and the persistence of pain, even after something like a total knee repair, that is repairing the joint and replacing it with brand new um, technology. Um, we at Hopkins have been very interested in treatments for pain, and so one of the things that we started studying a number of years ago were opioids, and we had a lot of hopium. And, the, the, and this is a boat in the Baltimore Harbor, no joking, where, right where I run. And I took a picture of it because I thought it was just too perfect for this kind of talk. And, and we have for years used pain medicines with hope that they would, as Penny said, be the right pill for the right person, intervening at the right point in the system. And the bottom line is it doesn't work that way. Our systems are so very complicated. It is the rare person who has persistent pain that can benefit from a single pill. It's often, as Penny said, a much more complicated array of treatments that involve the person becoming actively engaged. We, we talk to our, patient, our people with chronic pain um, about it's like diabetes. You know, your average diabetic has to do a whole lot of things during the day to take care of their pain. It's not just going into the doctor. It's not just taking, if, even if they are taking a pill. They have to exercise. They have to uh, lose weight and watch their weight. There are a variety of things. And pain has become like that. So when we talk to people with pain, we talk to them about the idea of actively engaging and having hope, but not necessarily hopium. Um, we do know that our pain medicines are not effective for everybody. This is kind of one of those nerdy intellectual s slides, but what it shows you is that um, this is from a trial we did at Hopkins, and what you see is that this is how much pain reduction p uh, one person got from taking an opioid, and this is how much another person got. Their pain actually got worse. And so what you see is there are a bunch of people who have virtually no response to opioids. They're some of our most effective pain medicines, and you see a bunch of people don't respond. So we know that um, opioids are not the solution, and we're finding more and more out because we have been very enthusiastic about having people with pain get opioid treatment for about a decade now, and we're seeing the aftermath of that. And the aftermath of that is that there are a lot of opioids that have been prescribed in primary care now for about a decade, and what's happening is the people who get those drugs in primary care have a lot of other comorbidities that might in fact indicate that they're less ideal candidates for those medicines. So they have a lot of psychiatric comorbidities in terms of depression, substance abuse, and even histories of narcotic abuse. Uh, we also now that we're getting more information on this see that the abuse, uh, kind of what we call abuse behaviors uh, can be co quite frequent in regular clinics um, when people are prescribed opioids. So what does this all mean? First of all, uh, contrary to what I just said, we know that pain is undertreated. And uh, Olivia's going to talk about that. We also know that both physicians and their, uh, and their people with pain are really concerned about how to manage this pain. And most people, I've interviewed hundreds of people before going on opioids, and they all have concerns about it. They're all worried that this is the end stage of an illness, that this is a sign that there's no, nothing else for them, so their hope is diminished when they're offered that prescription of opioids. They're worried about um, uh, becoming abusers, becoming addicted, becoming dependent. Those are very realistic concerns. They're not, not as prominent as most people think, but they are realistic concerns. We also know that uh, prescription opioids have been diverted in the past few years. And so some of the data that we have um, coming, uh, these are a little bit old, but what you see is an incredible surge in the diversion of, um, these are data from um, um, kind of hospital, uh, kind of pharmacy expenditures. And what you see is an incredible surge of, of pain medicines being um, uh, administered, kind of prescribed in around 2003, so about a decade ago. And what happened with this is we've also seen a surge in opioid-related deaths over the same similar period of time. So we know that we've got a real problem that these prescription opioids are getting out into the public, they're being diverted, they're not necessarily being diverted by the people with pain, but that does happen. They're being diverted by people who are um, um, uh, faking it and going to, to present to physicians. They're also being taken out of grandma's um, medicine cabinet or mom's medicine cabinet or my sister's medicine cabinet, okay? So we know that that's a problem. 
What's interesting, we also know that people who have pain are not getting a lot of treatment for pain. And so this is an interesting study from Germany where they just did regular old pain management strategies for people who were pre presenting at a specialty pain clinic, and they found incredible results just from doing old-fashioned pain medicine. These are things that have been around for more than 10 years. And your, your run-of-the-mill referral in their clinic, and it's probably exactly the case here in the US, was not getting the, the array of treatments that were available at that time. Um, so standard pain therapies are wildly unutilized. And in fact, I think, and I, you know, I work at Hopkins, I talk to the medical students, I talk to the residents a lot. We have a culture in, at Hopkins and in medicine where pain management means taking opioids. And that we've got to change that because that is not going to work for our, us as a society. So we've got to come up with much better treatments. So we really need research that develops new and develops and tests new treatments. We need new treatments. And then we really have got to identify way, the best ways to get these treatments that work into our healthcare system because our healthcare system is not using these treatments effectively. We also need, there's, a, there's um, I think Penny nicely described what I think of as a stepped care approach. There are a lot of people in our healthcare system that can benefit from a lot of self-management and a lot of things that they can do 24-7 uh, in their lives that will help them manage their pain. There are other people where we try those things and they need more professional help. And then there are other people who try all of that and they need even more professional help. And there are a lot of people who try all of that and they need to come into our inpatient units and get treatment for weeks around their disability and their treatment. So that's the idea of step care. We don't have that in, in pain and we really, really need it. We also need to help non-specialists non become better frontline providers. And then we also need to kind of figure out how do we best use the system so that our specialty clinics are well utilized and, and available to the, to the people who really need it. Because we have a clogged system. A lot of people are getting into specialty clinics that really could benefit from treatments in other, uh, in other settings. So I'll stop there. Thank you.